Alright, this is a delay, so... Don't worry about that. Alright, here we are. Welcome everybody. Welcome to the stream. Welcome to Perseverance Mars Rover Landing. It's an exciting and nervous day. Now we were here about almost seven months ago. Um, we recovered the launch of this um, mission. And now here we are, seven, almost seven months later. Um, it took off on July 30th and now finally February 18th. 2001 uh, not 2001 <laughs> 2021 um, it's landing okay now first off for those of you who are just figuring out that this is happening at all I saw some folks in the chat saying oh what's this we're landing on Mars we're sending people are we sending whatever is this a video game well for number one it's not a video game and we're not sending me Mars Europe uh, to Mars we're sending an, our new rover much like the Curiosity rover except for this is going to have um, a bit more experiments on board and one of them of which is a, a robot um, uh, robot helicopter and much much more let's see what NASA's, NASA's talking about science stuff he's got this mask on we'll tune into what he has to say in just a little bit but they don't have much to show on the screen other than what I'm probably going to show you too so why don't we go ahead and get into so, a trailer for this just, just so you guys can see what What's up ahead? Here we go. Let's take a watch. Okay, that was a, kind of a, a quick and dirty mission preview of what's about to happen. But what's at stake here is they're going to land, as you saw that whole anima animation sequence, that whole thing, let's see here, we'll go to landing animations. Well, I suppose we'll go into this. Let's have them explain instead of myself explain because this is just nuts. So as you saw, you whole, saw the whole landing sequence of going through the atmosphere, slowing down with a drag chute, and then <laughs> jettison the whole thing, have it come down on rockets, and then lower it on a sky crane, gently lower it, and then have the rocket part fly away, and then hopefully everything is fine. Um, but here we go. This is the one where they talk about just what's at stake. Nothing can be taken for granted when you get to Mars. There's a lot of things we just don't know. Space always has a way of throwing us curveballs and surprising us. I mean, until we get the data that says we're on the ground safely, I'm going to be worried that we're not going to make it. Entry, descent, and landing is often referred to as the seven minutes of terror because it takes about seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere of Mars to the ground safely. The 
spacecraft has to do all of this by itself. There are many things that have to go right to get Perseverance onto the ground safely. There's a lot counting on this. This is the first leg of our sample return relay race. There's a lot of work on the line. Starting about 10 minutes before atmospheric entry, we get rid of really the spacecraft part of, of the rover that's been supporting us. We come screaming in to the Martian atmosphere at 12 to 13,000 miles per hour. And the heat shield is what dissipates all that initial energy through friction. The vehicle will continue actually flying itself through the atmosphere. It's sort of like a transforming vehicle that went from spacecraft and now it's kind of like an aircraft actively guiding itself. When we're going slow enough, we deploy a parachute. It's the biggest supersonic parachute we've ever sent to another planet. It's critical for slowing down the vehicle. Perseverance's entry, descent, and landing borrows heavily from that of Curiosity. But fundamentally, Perseverance is a different rover. She's bigger, she has different instruments. We've added a lot of smarts on the inside to make it more capable so that it can deal with the landing site that we've given. The science team identified Jezero Crater as basically an ancient lake bed and one of the most promising places to look for evidence of ancient microbial life and to collect samples for future return to Earth. Uh, the problem is it's a much more hazardous place to land. If you look at Jezero, all you see is danger. How do we go to a site that we never thought was safe enough to go to before? So the heat shield, which has protected us all the way through entry, is no longer necessary. We need to get that off so that we can actually see the ground. And we can see the ground in a couple different ways. Perseverance will be the first mission to use terrain relative navigation. So while it's descending on the parachute, it will actually be taking images of the surface of Mars and determining where to go based on what it sees. This is finally like landing with your eyes open. Having this new technology really allows Perseverance to land in much more challenging terrain than Curiosity or any previous Mars mission could. Amongst the rocks and the craters and the cliffs, these things are hazardous to the rover, but these are the things that are interesting to the scientists. Once Perseverance has figured out where she is, we jettison the back shell and parachute and light up our rockets. Those rockets help us steer to a safe landing spot that's nearby. That descent stage takes us all the way down to about 20 meters off the ground. That's when we start the sky crane maneuver. Once the rover has hit the ground, the descent stage will cut loose from the rover and fly away to a safe distance. Surviving that seven minutes is really just the beginning for Perseverance. Its job, right, being the first leg of sample return to go look for those signs of past life on Mars. All that can't start until we get Perseverance safely to the ground. And then that's when the real mission begins. Nuts. Oh my gosh. I'm getting, I'm really getting nervous. <laughs> I don't know about you guys, but holy moly, does that, does that sound complicated? Um, we're going to tune in now to the NASA folks uh, while I calm my heart rate down from that last video. But as you saw, there's a lot to go through, a lot to, um, a lot, a lot that's going to be coming up. All right, let's tune on into the actual stream from NASA. 20 seconds from entry interface. Okay, Might so recognize some faces here. Cruise separation till entering the top of the atmosphere. From then out and out, things happen fast. We are switching fast. to the MFSK tones. Telemetry will have stopped. Telecom is confirming that the spacecraft has switched to broadcasting tones. These tones are received directly from Perseverance, but have very limited information content. We won't receive real-time information until about. Um, nine, ten minutes from now, once the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter starts relaying information from Perseverance. We are under a minute from cruise stage separation, about ten and a half minutes from entry interface. So the back of that thing, that, that little Good bit of a exciting. computer yeah, animation yeah, thing, is um, the sta uh, current status of the, um, the spacecraft. It's going to separate from that okay. and then start going so into the atmosphere in a few minutes. Um, as you can see, they're just going to give us a whole rundown of things as it goes on. There's the back of the spacecraft again. It's going to separate from that sun shield, not sun shield, um, a solar array, and then head on down into Mars's atmosphere. Of course, this is all computer-animated stuff because we can't have any cameras 
giving us footage from real time, let alone have cameras in the back of a spacecraft this far away. Now, okay, here we go. Let's, let's listen here. Okay, it's separating. We have indication that crew stage separation has been confirmed by the spacecraft. We're off on a good start. In about one minute, Perseverance's landing software will wake up and begin the final preparations for entry. The first action it will do is to fire warm-up pulses with its entry thrusters. These pulses ensure that the spacecraft gets the thrust that it wants during entry interface. We are about nine minutes from entry interface. All right, so nine minutes till we start hitting some of that top of the atmosphere, as okay, far as I understand. But it uh, separated it nice and smoothly direction. from Please the uh, the rest of that, and it's oh yeah, and, <laughs> that's uh, the peanuts you guys are talking about. Uh, I was like, what are you guys talking about peanuts? Uh, the yes, the there, that is nuts. This is going to go very quickly from here on out. Okay, now we have set the seven minutes of terror, as they talked about. Seven minutes for the spacecraft to get from the top of the atmosphere the to the surface of Mars, and on top of that. We're going to have a delay of of any of this happening. I think it's seven or f 14 or seven, 17 minutes. So 14, 14 to 7 minutes. The signal that the crew stage went between the Perseverance entry capsule and Earth. So we saw a little blip uh, in the data stream indicating the crew stage separation. We have confirmation that the vehicle has started warming up those entry thrusters. Pulses have begun. All right, we've got a counter down there, 8 minutes and 30 seconds until entry. They're warming up their thrusters so that way they can maneuver through the atmosphere. At now, Mars's point, atmosphere is about 1% of Earth's atmosphere, so even though it does have an atmosphere, it's very, zero. very light, which is and another reason why most of these landings take place entry. on the around the equator of Mars. So that way, when they come in, they have a lot of stuff to slow the down the craft, the slow it down long enough so that way it can then bring out its parachute and then slow it down to about two kilometers, not two miles per hour, I think it is. We are about seven and a half minutes from entry interface. Okay, the vehicle is pointed in the right direction. <laughs> well, that's good. <laughs> warmed up and doing their job. And you would think they'd uh, make we've sure we've it's pointed in the right direction before all this. Two revolutions per minute that the vehicle had the whole way to uh, the way to Mars as a spin-stabilized spacecraft, and then from here on out, it's going to just be a bullet, and it's going to control its orienta orientation and attitude via rockets on the back of the uh, back points shell. carrier lock. Uh, sorry, and we're the DTE from uh, radio science from uh, Green Bank reports carrier lock. You see the carrier on the downlink. Thank you all guys for coming to watch this on our channel, on the Ghost Draft channel. Um, Mars Europe, um, Sparks is on his way. He's out there in, in Texas with all that weather, so we hope we can get a signal from him sometime soon. from uh, Greenback that they are receiving direct to Earth telemetry via that path. The spacecraft Perseverance is currently transmitting heartbeat tones. These tones indicate that Perseverance is operating normally and has nothing significant to report. Okay, that's good. So everything, it's, you know, it's life signs are, are nominal and uh, telemetry is being sent. So everything so far so good. Okay. It's a cool lanyard. And now we wait. As soon as we get to the top of the atmosphere, the atm uh, it will be very quickly, which is the entry point. It, it won't be very long before the, the, the atmosphere will start getting thicker and thicker. It's going very quickly at a, at a fairly steep angle of 15 degrees uh, into the atmosphere. And as it starts to slow we're down... just under uh, we're about five and a half minutes from entry interface. We're still receiving heartbeat tones. Uh, we expect to continue receiving heartbeat tones until about five minutes after entry. At that time, Perseverance will be no longer in view of our antennas here on Earth. About 90 seconds prior to entry, the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter should begin receiving telemetry from Perseverance and streaming it to Earth in near real time. Uh, there are a few expected short outages, such as when we have a plasma backout or when we enter the peak heating phase. 
aside from these outages caused by the plasma blackout, antenna switching, or high dynamic events, spacecraft events, we should have telemetry until about 90 seconds after landing. Uh, a plasma blackout is when the signal from Perseverance isn't strong enough to make it through the superheated, super fast air blowing around the spacecraft all the way down to Earth. Once the temperature drops below that peak heating, we do reacquire the signal from Perseverance. We are currently about four and a half minutes from entry interface. A lot of nervous faces. Perseverance continues to report heartbeat tones, indicating everything is nominal. So she's, she's saying that uh, we're going to continue to get signals from um, Perseverance all the way down, but as soon as it starts hitting that upper atmosphere and it's burning through the atmosphere, we're gonna, it's not going to have a signal strong enough to go through all that interference. And so, and so it's, it's, that's that blackout time of seven minutes of we don't know <laughs> if it survives the landing until after it's landed or maybe it doesn't land. It should be in a few minutes here. We're just Flight local minutes one. from entry interface. So that's that's w well, part of the concern of all this is that there's a lot of communication no, delay. DD so right now their uh, antennas uh, are pointing towards Earth, but soon it's we, we Perseverance is going to go uh, around Mars, uh, where it's no longer pointing towards Earth, so it has to relay its information control. to Around another time, Mars orbiter, which then that sends information to Earth. Telemetry from Perseverance, and will continue to record that telemetry until several minutes post landing. We won't get that data for several hours after landing as it's being recorded, and then will be forwarded to Earth later. We are continuing to receive heartbeat tones, indicating that everything is nominal. We're currently at about three minutes until entry interface. And uh, somebody asked, why does why does people have um, uh, Mars uh, 2020 on it? It's because it took off in the year 2020. From our radio on the rover. Took off on July 30th, 2020, and has taken almost seven months to get there. Now it's uh, February 18th, 2021. Uh, since then, um, it's a uh, arbitrary place in the sky that we've defined to be above the atmosphere. But th but from that point on, uh, there's definitely uh, atmosphere, and b above it, there isn't. We are two minutes from entry interface. Perseverance is to transmit heartbeat tones, indicating everything is nominal. So the tones can tell us whether something is bad or not is happening. So, so far the heartbeat is, is doing well. So the vehicle thinks it's help, it's uh, in good shape to land. That's good. <laughs> That's good to hear. It's like, yeah, I feel, I feel kind of silly repeating the same things to you guys as I'm hearing it. And, uh, I'm uh, thinking, um, I should just let you guys hear this, but, uh, hopefully I can synthesize this a little bit better than, you know, kind of the, the raw data information that they're giving us. As it gets closer to Mars, Perseverance is actually being pulled in by gravity and accelerating. By the time Perseverance reaches entry interface point, she should be going just under 5.4 kilometers per second. We're at about 90 seconds from entry interface and standing by for Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter to pick up the telemetry. So the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter is the satellite around Mars that we get all of our information from the rovers and other satellites around Mars that then gets sent back to Earth. Now the Reconnaissance Orbiter is getting really old. They really need to send out a new one. So I hope that's <laughs> on, the, on the progress board um, because after that, you know, we just have to hope, we have to wait till you know, Earth, Mars... Um, our instruments on Mars point towards Earth to send information. Uh, so again, once uh, the uh, Perseverance, uh, its antenna no longer faces towards Earth, it's going to send its signals towards the Reconnaissance Orbiter, and the Reconnaissance Orbiter is going to send us information from there. But once it goes through the atmosphere, we won't be able to send any signals until it's on the ground. And that's the scary part, where we won't know until way later. <laughs> um, well, not way later, a few minutes later, whether or not the... ...is going about 5.2 kilometers per second and is about 190 kilometers altitude above the surface of Mars. Confirm your HF data flow. 190 kilometers above the Earth. I mean, above Mars. All right, we've got some, uh, some telemetry here. I wish um, I could read all this stuff 
fast enough to understand what it is because I'm too excited to understand what's on what's in front of my face. Okay, we got the uh, wait for entry. We're at number seven. There's the creator over there. After this, um, after we land or do not land, I will uh, I'll show you Jez uh, Jezro Crater. Um, not in game, but in real life. They I got a map here ready to show you guys. Perseverance is currently going 5.3 kilometers per second at an altitude of about 120 kilometers from the surface of Mars. And to let you know, what's what's to be found there? What they're going to be doing there? They got a tiny little helicopter on board. What are they going to do with that? They have it's some oxygen making equipment. Until it begins feeling the atmosphere of Mars slow it down. Once there is enough atmosphere, it will start controlling its path to the landing target. Again, once the uh, once it goes through the atmosphere, as you saw in the video I played right before this, uh, the um, a little bit of that slowdown of the atmosphere on the Perseverance entry capsule. As it goes through, after it has its atmospheric shield come off, little sensors are going to guide the rover to the ground, and it's basically going to look the computer is going to fly itself to the ground by actually looking at it. Before we just sent things, and we could just kind of hope we hit it, kind of like you throw a dart board, throw a dart at a dart board from millions of miles away. This time we're sending a dart at a dart board millions of miles away. But then, as it gets closer, a little computer is going to open up an eyeball at the end of that dart and try to steer it to the center. We have indications that Perseverance is now performing bank reversals in the atmosphere. These are the steps in order to control its distance to the landing target. Uh, so now it's an aircraft. Through the point of maximum deceleration and has indicated that it felt approximately 10 Earth G's of deceleration. Jeez. Okay, it's it's feeling some some turbulence there. And now is transferred from space uh, spacecraft so into aircraft as it's going through the air and actually uses its, with its thrusters like uh, maneuvering itself in the atmosphere to get it to that target Our site. Is still continuing to perform bank reversals in the atmosphere to control its distance to the landing target. Because even though it's like the little like you know gumdrop. Thing. It can actually, f you can actually fly it. Astronauts coming through the atmosphere and the Apollo spacecrafts and Gemini and all those guys, they've been, they were actually able to uh, fly in the atmosphere, so that way they wouldn't uh, land off course. An altitude of about 16 kilometers from the surface of Mars. Okay, we started at over 100 kilometers. Now we're at just 16 kilometers. Which means Perseverance is no longer trying to control the distance to Mars, but in to the target on Mars, but instead is flying straight to the target looks like we got uh, you know we got we trimmed we trimmed our trims and uh, zeroed in on where we're gonna go and now we're just gonna try to keep on track hopefully those thrusters uh, and their their uh, control systems do not fail Our current velocity is about 550 meters per second at an altitude of about 15 kilometers from the surface. MRO is reporting good telemetry log. We are coming upon the straighten up. We are starting the straighten up and fly right maneuver where the spacecraft will jettison the entry balance masses in preparation for parachute deploy and to roll over to give the radar a better look at the ground. Okay, the radar is going to look at that ground and try to figure out where it's going to land. The has confirmed that the parachute has deployed and we are seeing significant deceleration in the velocity. Our current velocity is 430 meters per second at an altitude of about 12 kilometers from the surface of Mars. God, imagine that. There's something we made as human beings and it's floating in the atmosphere of another planet. It's doing that right now, guys. Yeah. Perseverance has now slowed to subsonic speeds, and the heat shield has been separated. This allows 
both the radar and the cameras to get their first look at the surface. Current velocity is 145 meters per second and an altitude of about 10 kilom nine and a half kilometers above the surface. We might be able to get some images now that the heat shield's off. Uh, for Mars InSight, we were able to see, actually see the ground um, before it landed. So I wonder if they'll be able to do that here. Yes. 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 Sounds like good news. Now has radar lock on the ground. Current velocity is about 100 meters per second. 6.6 yes. .6 kilometers of the surface. Right. Perseverance is continuing to descend on the parachute. We are coming up on the initialization of terrain okay. relative navigation. Perseverance is about to fall out of the spacecraft the at this engine. point. This is, my, this is the, the most about 90 craziest part for me. At an altitude of 4.2 kilometers. 4K off the ground. That's usually when I put my landing gear down. confirmation that the lander vision system has produced a valid solution in part of terrain relative navigation. So it's the spacecraft is actively looking at the we ground, being like, okay, where do I put my feet down? Current velocity is 83 meters per second at about 2.6 kilometers oh, from the falling. surface of Mars. We have confirmation that the back shell has separated. We are currently performing the divert maneuver. Current velocity is about 75 meters per second at an altitude of about a kilometer off the surface of Mars. Here in safety, Bravo. God, this is crazy part. It's descending on the rockets. We have completed our terrain relative navigation. Current speed is about 30 meters per second, altitude of about 300 meters off the surface of Mars. So it just separated from the parachute and is free falling, turns its rockets on, and now it's going to do a rocket descent, and then after that, crane time. Velocity accordion, which means we are conducting the sky crane, about to conduct the sky crane maneuver. We've lost direct to Earth tones. As expected. As expected. Sky team maneuver has started. About 20 meters off the surface. Ease her down. Ease her down. We're getting signals from M MRO. Touch nicely. UHF is good. Touchdown confirmed. Yeah. Perseverance yeah. safely on the surface of Mars. Alright. Ready to begin seeking the sands of past life. We did it guys, we did it. Oh man. The stage has away to safe distance. Perseverance is continuing to Okay the rock they said the rockets are flying away to a safe distance to crash. And uh, Perseverance is safely on the ground on Mars. It's going to start waking up its systems, taking pictures of itself, and sending it back home. Oh, my God. oh we did it. We did it. Okay, now the thing has to turn on. Alright, all stations. Wow, he got it. <laughs> <laughs> his eyes. Look at his eyes. Wow. Wide eyed. Look at those pupils. So wide. Beside themselves. It's oh, it's it's so surreal. Stay tuned. We might get some pictures. Okay. Hopefully we we'll get some pictures from the descent when the heat shield popped off, and hopefully some pictures. Um, a nice selfie on the ground of of Mars. The the Jezer crater. Riding on this. You know, yeah, we just heard the news that Perseverance is alive on the surface of Mars. Yeah. Okay, let me take you to where they are. Here we go. Here's. Copy activity. That is as expected. Let's see here. Life to exist on the Martian surface today, but after Jezero Crater formed, billions. Sorry about that. One second. Okay. Emerald is still seeing a strong signal from the lander. I'm gonna leave the um, JPL audio on while I show you Jezero Creator.
Billions of years ago, water filled it to form a deep lake about the we same size the as Lake Tahoe. Eventually, as Mars climate Mars. changed, Lake Jezero dried up and surface water and disappeared from the planet. Like An ancient lake is a fantastic place image. to pursue. Here we're getting we're some images. Image. It's a tiny JPEG. <laughs> I think it's uh I think it's 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 a profile avatar. Uh, the target point on the map when you are ready. We are ready, OL3. Go for it. Okay, remember the first images from anywhere are always super tiny so that way we can get them uh, right away and then they send in the ultra, you know, images later cuz it takes a while to it's not much bandwidth in space. I'll be uh, moving in, showing you the safe zone that we've landed in. All right, here we go. It's kind of like you're looking right out the spacecraft. Just put the first image from Perseverance on the surface of Mars. Now it comes from the engineering cameras, known as the hazard camera. Uh, this camera is mainly used to help the rover drive safely around Mars, and we will get higher resolution photos later in the day. Look at that, there we are. That's what it's looking at it right now. Let's put the giant camera in front of the historic photo. <laughs> Nuts severance. I like that. Another, oh, another shot of that from the Mars lander there before we go over to the um, Jezero crater again. <laughs> People giving each other props. And in fact, yes, we, we all did it in a way, right? Humanity. All of, all of humanity's knowledge and ingenuity has led up to this point. And in a way that, you know, I felt like I was on the spaceship. I was feeling really nervous today. And I felt like I'm, I'm on that spaceship. I'm about to land. And, okay, another image here. Our second image is in. And would you believe it? Rocks. Okay, this, these, these, we have a camera in the front and out rear of the, of the, of the <laughs> spacecraft. Uh, it's, uh, it's, More it's, rocks. They're near the ground, so you're pretty close. You can see the Who wheels there. Uh, and and and, the, and they're a little dirty because we've got uh, glass covers over these these cameras, but uh, we took these seconds after landing, so so there's still dust in the air from our landing event. Uh, so this is this is happening. Um, uh, you know, this happened just like a little ago. bit of color. Just no, it's on. still monochrome. Uh, this is really amazing. And, and, uh, we even Some know boulders we there. I mean, imagine how big those boulders are are for the wheels. Landed because it figured it out. You know, this is a sign. NASA works. NASA works. And when we put our arms together and our yeah. hands together and our brains together, we can succeed. This is what NASA does. This is what we can do as a country on all We're of doing the problems it. We, we have. We need to work together to do these kinds of things and make success happen. Joining us now is the acting administrator of NASA, Steve. Okay, we're going to put the... And congrats. Whoa. Hey, thank you. What an amazing day. How does it feel to have another rover on Mars? Pretty uh, cool, I think. I think it's really great. Uh, we couldn't have done this without all the people who did it, and thanks to them, they, they did it, and I'm here to let you know that we just did it. Okay, let's go to something a little bit more interesting. Not that he's boring, it's just that um, this is um, Our goal moving, of looking moving for pictures. Possible Martian okay, so life. this is the, the crater they Earth, landed lakes in. Lakes are filled with living creatures. Evidence of that life is often preserved in the mud and sand deposited on the bottom of the lake. So, we use the rover's instruments to explore the rocks of the ancient lake bed. Here we can see evidence of the former lake. The canyon cutting through the crater rim was carved by a river. As the water entered the lake, it slowed and dropped the sand and mud it was carrying to form the fan-shaped delta. 
So this is where White line Perseverance is, is now. That's, this is why we sent them there. Years, called the Prime Mission. During this period, we used the rover science instruments to analyze the lake sediments. After we explore the delta, we hope to investigate the shoreline of the former lake. To get there, we have to traverse around a sea of modern sand dunes. From this perspective, you can see former shorelines curving around a headland. We can picture waves in Lake Jezero beating on a sandy beach. Now, all this um, finally, terrain is actual photos Jezero and high-res, um, that's the actual um, rocks from instruments in the Martian crust, uh, name, is the high-res uh, tele telemetry, topography. Rocks would have been hot, and so, so the this is kind of the same technology the they would use on Earth to look at like mountains and whatnot. In our so, for possible ancient life on Mars. Um, you're seeing the actual what things would look like if you're flying around there. There's a guy I've I've spoken to a couple times um, online, and he does a lot of these images, and they're really cool. Um, so okay, let's look at the um, the the helicopter I was telling you guys about. Um, the first time we're gonna send a uh, uh, not just a helicopter, but any sort of flying thing. Um, it's totally first. Um, it's, now this helicopter, it's not going to do too much when it's there, it's just proving that you can fly a helicopter on Mars. Sometimes you have to do something just to show that you can do it. When the Wright brothers flew for the first time, they flew an experimental aircraft. And in the same way, the Mars helicopter is designed to show that we can fly powered helicopter flight in the Martian atmosphere. From day one, this was the unwavering dream of our team, to get our helicopter launched to Mars so that we can get the opportunity to do the very first rotorcraft flight test in the actual environment of Mars. A little robot helicopter is inside the rover. It's extremely difficult to fly at Mars because the atmosphere is so thin. Compared to Earth, at Mars it's less than 1%. So the first and foremost challenge is to make a vehicle that's light enough to be lifted. And then the second is to generate lift. The rotor system has just been very fast. 2,000, 2,200, 2,400, 2,600. We're spinning between uh, 2,000 and 3,000 revolutions per minute, and it takes a lot of energy. So it's that balance of a very light system, yet having enough energy that's needed to you know, spin the rotor so fast to lift, and on top of it, having to design in the autonomy it has to be fully autonomous from the time it takes off to the time it lands. What we do do on the ground is we plan the flights, and so we determine from here where we want the helicopter to go. Our experiment window is 30 Martian days. So we have planned uh, up to five flights of incremental difficulty. The very first flight, the main thing is we want to get the legs off the ground, and so we will basically go up uh, about three meters and we'll hover there uh, and then we'll come down again. And that will be the first, you know, really major milestone. Most of our flights will be at the three to five meter height. We will be going horizontally again at a few meters per second, probably go out, you know, 50, 70 meters and come back. In successive flights, we'll probably push that further, try to go further. So our priority will be to get back engineering telemetry and not so much images, but I'm sure we'll return a few, you know, because they'll always look cool. At this point, cool. we've tested all we can on Earth. We have mathematical models that shows how it will fly at Mars, and we've tested it in the simulated environment that we can create on Earth. It really is time now to do the real flight test at Mars. Nothing is a given, but we have done everything we can in terms of a test program here on Earth. The vehicle is performing extremely well so far. It's been doing exactly the right thing, even right now, and it's bolted onto the Perseverance rover. So there's a very good chance that we'll pull it off, yes. But it's still high risk, and none of us forget that you could have a glitch that, you know, could mean end of mission, yes. It's going to be exciting, reacting to any surprises we have. We can't wait. <laughs> What's really most important is everything we're learning here is for the future rotorcraft systems that we want to introduce into space exploration. Future rotorcraft systems. Okay, that's interesting. Makes you wonder what are they planning on uh, taking to Mars when humans go there? 
Okay, man. This has been crazy. Okay, let me go. Cool. We went through the whole uh, landing and descent thing here. Um, let's see. I wanted to show you one more thing. I wanted to show you this image here, just illustrating like how kind of crazy this this whole mission was. You know, going through the atmosphere, cruise separation, then going you know going through the atmosphere here, guided entry. Then you got the parachute going off. Shield shield comes off. That's fine. But then you got your radar lock. It's looking at the ground. It's trying to figure out where the best spot is without too much slope, without too much rocks, and then dropping the, the, the very very fragile, expensive uh, equipment. Then the rockets go on, and then again radar and all that kind of stuff go on, and then lowering it on the sky crane. And then this part flies away and crashes over there. We'll get pictures of that later. Um, and it, and they did it. They they only just went and freaking did it. Let's see if there's anything else going on in NASA. Let's see. Let's tune in and see what they're talking about. You can see all my mask markings down. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were just celebrating, and rightly so. Now, you've been around for a number of Mars landings. What makes this one special? Well, you know, two things. I mean, it's the biggest and best rover we've ever sent to Mars. Um, and, and it can really, you know, do amazing things in terms of, uh, you know, its own scientific exploration of this habitable environment, you know, at Jezero. Um, but, you know, it's also, as, as, as you've heard today, you know, it's the first step in Mars sample return. So really, you know, it's, it's not only doing its own mission, it's setting us up for a series of missions and to bring those samples back. And, you know, a lot of the effort to develop the rover uh, was specifically designed, you know, for that sampling and caching system. It's one of the most complex robotic systems ever made. And, uh, you know, having it down safely means Mars sample return continues right on course and, and, uh, and, and we are moving forward. Wonderful. Now, JPL has a long history with robotic space exploration. Why do you think it's so important to continue to push those boundaries? You, you know, there's a lot of reasons. I mean, obviously, it, you know, for, for places that are far away, like Mars, and even farther away, uh, you know, like Europa, uh, right now, robots are the, robotic exploration is the only way we can uh, make these scientific discoveries and really understand these early uh, habitable environments. In the case of Europa, maybe it's even still habitable. And, uh, you know, we're not ready to, to, to go there with astronauts yet, uh, but the robots are ready to go there. And so we always, uh, you know, are forerunners and pathfinders uh, of, of, of human exploration. And we start by sending, you know, our eyes and, and arms there in the form of a robot. And um, it is just fantastic to be able to do that and to learn from each rover, learn from the science and the engineering and make the next one better and make more and more discoveries. And every time we do one of these missions, we make fabulous discoveries. And, uh, and you know, each one is, is more exciting uh, than the last. The future does look exciting. Now, as director of JPL, what would you like to say to those teams right now celebrating? Oh, you know, obviously they, they have earned it. Let me, let me tell you, I mean, they... Uh, have worked, you know, for years and years on this mission. And then in the past year, of course, we had the COVID experience. And, and you know, I want to thank not only the team, but also, you know, all of JPL. You know, a lot of folks had to, had to, uh, had to uh, pitch in here, you know, in terms of making sure our remote telework, you know, our, our IT systems were good enough. Now, he mentioned a couple of things that um, I want to highlight is that they're going to do a um, Mars sample capture and return. So Mars, is, uh, the rover is going to, Use with its onboard laboratory, dig up some Martian soil. Uh, it's going to do some onboard science, but then it's going to actually leave some of it for another mission to come, land on Mars, pick up that stuff, and then take it back. Uh, so it's a part of an ongoing mission. There's so many missions wrapped up into this one. Uh, they've really got their synergy worth. You really got your money's worth with this one. Now with um, the Moxie project, which is trying to uh, create oxygen out of the Martian air for future humans. Um, uh, testing out that uh, technology, you have the helicopter technology. Seeing how Martian air and um, Earth Earth electronics uh, mix, and then one other thing, um, the sample return, um, and I, I, I'm forgetting one more thing. But yeah, this this is just an one of many robotic missions that we're going to be sending out there as you heard the director of jpl was mentioning europa i mean w it's not feasible to send humans out there but it is feasible to send robots and robots can work out there longer um and more safe also because um, humans there's a lot of dangers that not 
that's not just telemetry and food and oxygen, but there's a lot of other factors, uh, safety um, of, of humans out in space for a long time, whereas you have these missions like Juno to uh, Jupiter and Cassini to Saturn. You can do all these missions for huge uh, extended uh, periods of time, and then you don't have to worry about it, then it coming back home. Um, as you can see, they're showing the Mars um, helicopter uh, video that we uh, watched just a little, a little while ago. But I think, um, personally, I'm more excited about the robot missions than human missions. Human missions, of course, are going to be great milestones for humanity in gen general, getting ourselves into different places than just Earth and the Moon um, and our low Earth orbit. But I think... Uh, extending ourselves with robotics and autonomous systems, I think that's really the way to go. Um, and I wish uh, I wish Sparks could be here so that we can um, trade uh, trade ideas uh, on this. But maybe we'll do that on an next stream on Saturday. Um, but you know what? I'm so glad you guys were here to see this, experience this, share this whole experience with me, and. I'm going to go through all, all of your uh, your comments and read them because um, there's so many uh, going on right now. I can't read them all right now. But we did it. We landed on Mars. We're going to do some more science. And I can't wait for the pictures that they're going to send out for the next couple of weeks because we're going to get a lot of high-res stuff, a lot of high-res video. Uh, they're going to send the video of the whole descent thing, just like they did with InSight. Now, before I go, I want to show you some... Um, some places where you can go to watch these videos, look at some photos. Um, you want to go to the Mars 2020 mission, Perseverance. So mars.nasa.gov. Um, do I have it up here? You can kind of see it in the thing. I have um, the top of the the window clipped off. But if you go to, to there, you can. there's a whole bunch of uh, videos, photos, and other uh, interactive guides that help you follow along with the mission and understand more what they're doing and what they hope to do and I'm sure this will be updated as the mission goes on but again thank you all thank you so much for coming we're gonna go oh <laughs> as Sparks says the internet is back on right, we're gonna have him come on just for a couple of minutes if you guys want to hear me and Sparks talk about um, robots in space and humans in space um, stay on for just a couple of minutes and but let's see here let's get so let me text sparks okay come on now 200 people are waiting <laughs> lol okay add, add the lol so that way he, he knows i wasn't mad at him all right and then we'll talk a little bit more um hopefully maybe he'll join us with a song i don't know let's see Okay, while we wait for him to come on over, um, a lot of these videos are really fun to watch. I can't remember which one I like the most. I think I like I like the um, the landing animations. I'll play that in the background while we talk with Sparks. Sparks, 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 where are you coming? And I love how nuts the chat has been. You guys are crazy for for space here. So this is where we came into the stream, where that whole separation took place. And Minnie, we love you. Sparks, is that you? That's me. Wonderful. Sorry, buddy. Internet's been a little weird here in Texas because it's cold. I hear that uh, Mars has a better internet connection than you right now. That's for 
the first time in history that is actually true. <laughs> so, what's going on? Mars, fill me in. All right, all right, here we go. Well, we're watching a replay of uh, Mars Perseverance landing on Mars. So we did it. We did it, Sparks. We did it. I, I realized that you were just coming into society and realizing that we have landed on Mars <laughs> once again. Wait, wait, we already did it? I was, like, so prepped for, for watching us do it. No, no, no. It already happened. At 3.55, we landed on Mars. Wow. We did it. Wait. 3.55. Yeah. Minus the top. So... Okay, yeah, so adding for the additional... Yeah, so now it's proven, right? Because now we're way past the, the limit for, for data coming back. Right. So I was just talking to chat about... Um, uh, what's it called? I was just talking about the, about the future of robotic exploration versus human exploration um, in the cosmos. And I was saying that mm. I'm looking more forward towards robotic missions than the humans because of the limitations of sending the human and in terms of science gathering. And I know that um, you've always been on the side of, you know, awe-inspiring stuff, you know, b being able to inspire generations of astronomers. And while I've always taken the side of um, what can we what can we get that we can use? Yeah, well, I think that there's uh, uh, there's there's a different way of looking at where where you put humans, right? So um, humans are the ones who get to interpret the data, right? So uh, the robots are much better at collecting it, especially in dangerous environments. Um, but humans are necessary for giving a shit. <laughs> like robots can collect all the data they want, but like, I mean, what does it mean, right? So I feel like uh, humans are a lagging indicator for our progress. So when we put humans on the moon, um, that was that was kind of silly. We probably could have just done that with robots. But the fact is, is that like when we are sending robots to Mars, um, the fact that humans are able to be on Earth is is a lagging indicator. When humans are able to be on the moon and Mars, and then we send people to those places regularly that's kind of a new station where we're like, well, we now feel Mars and the moon are safe. And so now what's dangerous? And we always want to send robots to the dangerous places. But I, th I think I think the lagging indicator is about like, wh wh what have we conquered so well that we now feel comfortable putting, uh, you know, our our very vulnerable bodies in? So so, so to me, that's that's more of like the, the metric. We shouldn't just be putting people in a rocket and sending them to an unknown origin, however cool that sounds. Yeah, they were mentioning Europa, going to Europa next, because they said there could even be life there uh, as of now, because they think there's some conditions over there that might be um, pre not preferable, but um, favorable for life, um, as of, as opposed to Mars, which is kind of a de pretty much been determined devoid of life. And you know, there's some <laughs> areas of Mars that um, you know theoretically could, but there's some places like around Saturn. I believe it's uh, is it Enceladus? No, I can't remember. The wh whichever one is uh, shooting out um gas um into um, uh, in into this into space. I think it's Enceladus because it's the E ring that it's, it's shooting out all this stuff. In any case, they found um like amino acids and a bunch of like organic substances in in that spray when they uh, sent Cassini over. Now, now they're saying right. that you know Europa might have uh, conditions there too, and well, Euro like... Europa has always been like looked at from the scientific uh, data uh, to infuse uh, you know different science fiction writers uh, about Europa, right? Like yeah. we have we have a lot of people talking about going to Europa and the the. Um, I mean, there's actually a, a sci-fi horror about going to Europa that was interesting. But <laughs> Europa has, has previously just been, oh, that one place that we know that there's probably water. You know what I mean? Like that's that's been Europa's kind of thing since 19 uh, since the 1980s. Um, and and that's what I mean. It's like you know, once once we are able to say like, oh, like landing on Mars is easy, um, we'll 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 be more predisposed to sending robots to Europa to take a look at it. I mean, it's it's pretty far. I mean, yeah, that's... you can do so much more with a robot than you can do with a human. 
but I, I see the I see the I see the appeal. <laughs> I I sound so um, disjointed from the human race when I say this, but I, I see the appeal uh, the appeal humans have for sending themselves to other places. Um, but in terms of of a science um, standpoint, there's so much you can do with a robotic mission that you can't do um, with a uh, with a human mission. I mean, but having said that, there there is the difference of looking at pictures from space taken from spacecraft and having astronauts tell them how how it feels to see that um, and then also being the astronaut and being able to see that and I would love to be that astronaut who gets to go to Europa or Mars or what have you um, but I'm also thinking of another bigger picture I, I feel like there's two big pictures here and they're both kind of competing um, do you feel do you feel the same way in in those regards in like a philosophical way and also a kind of like a, a sciencey way? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that like uh, everybody in chat has been having a, a great discussion, except for the discussion about nuts. But um... oh, you missed you missed the nuts. <laughs> There's okay. a guy with a uh... giant jar of nuts behind him, and everybody was like, "Look at those nuts!" <laughs> okay. Well, I think I think many like put it actually kind of best. Like orbital station plus ground base is always a good way to do it. Like um, philosophically, um, like we think that we're so separate from robots, but we're we're really not. They're things that we've made. Like, do you, do you think ants think about this? Like, do you think that ants dig tunnels and are milking aphids in their little colony, and they think, oh, like you know, the, <laughs> these the, these things are so different. Like, like the you know darn these ant roads like we, we kind of <laughs> always think that we're so like oh those roads those are those aren't alive but we are alive it's like look man like you and your iphone and your roads and your spaceships like we're all kind of um one entity in the same way that like you could you could spit on the floor and like that's still something that's it's a part of you we we, we tend to like i think over index on um, thinking that we're a part of our technology, like technology is 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 them and not us, and it's like yeah, no, we're we're actually all involved in. Yeah, this. we programmed it. I mean, uh, technology will only do what we tell it to do, even if it's the wrong thing. We told it wrong, right? Yeah, that's right. That's right. And that and that's a, that's a huge ethical thing that people are dealing with with AI now, right? Which is like, oh well, if if you program the robot to like kill two humans instead of a hundred, like. Is the robot responsible? It's like, no, I think the guy who programmed it is probably responsible, but it'll never be tracked back to him. Yeah. Um, oh, there's something I was going to say. Um, I don't remember what it was. Oh, yeah, I was going to say, uh, there's a story where, um, do you think crabs think that fish can fly? Like, from their perspective, like they're thinking, wow, yeah. look at all these things. They can fly. And I don't think I I don't think so. I, I don't I don't think they do. And then um and then when they come out of the, out of the water, they're like, "Wow, these fish sure are dry." <laughs> well, my 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 favorite uh, exposition on that has always been um, Hamlet in a dog's world. Yeah. Yeah, cool. like like Hamlet exists in a dog's world, right? Like you uh -huh. can take a dog, you can pet your golden retriever, you can put Hamlet in its mouth. And it, it is exposed to Hamlet. But does it know anything about the story? No. It just thinks Hamlet is this this thing it can't eat. You know what I mean? Like it's just it's like it's <laughs> okay. just a book. Right? So like uh yeah, I don't know where I was going with that. But, but yeah, all, but all back, I'm back is, to Mars. Back to Mars. Yeah. But um uh sorry, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Okay. Uh, I just got a picture of here of uh, Jezreel Crater, uh, the path that um, the lander is going to be, uh, the lander, the rover, <laughs> it's, it, it's already done being a lander, uh, it's going to take as it uh, goes through this ancient uh, delta, river delta, as you can see here, this is where the water came through and spread um, all the sediment and stuff across here, and I actually, I think it landed here, and then it's going to go that way, but honestly, it could have obviously gone this way, I'm pretty sure it's landed here. Um, so yeah. So you might have already got, gone over this, but like, what are the primary mission objectives about this particular uh, jump into Mars again? Uh, we, we... This particular mission is going into a crater that definitely had some water in it ages ago, 
and it has evidence of a river going through here, um, a delta here, and then on the other side of the um, the crater, which it won't go towards because it's too far away, is an outlet to river. So water definitely came through here. It was a whole system coming in this way, going out that way, and it's going to explore the sediments, um, the different layers, kind of like how we saw it in coastal, um, like in Santa Barbara, we saw uh, the the bluffs. And you could see like the different layers of of um, crustaceans. You could actually see the different um, uh, ages of of shellfish and stuff in, in the in the in the cliffs. So it's going to look at the cliffs, um, and then uh, look at the dirt and see if it can see any sign of past life as it goes along this plain and explore also the beaches of this uh, ancient ancient lake. Okay. But okay. on is on there... side of that, on side of that, it also has a tiny ro robot helicopter. It's gonna like do a technology test, uh, see how um, how robots fly in the Martian air, and it's also gonna do a test run of technology called Moxie, which they're gonna take the Martian er Martian um, atmosphere and turn it into oxygen that humans could then uh, breathe, uh, and then also it's gonna do a sample return where they're gonna get a bunch of uh, Martian soil analyze it whatnot, not then put it on the ground and then drive away and then another spacecraft is going to come pick it up and take it back to earth <laughs> which we did on, so, on the moon so, actually so, so so this particular crater though yeah they're, they're looking for evidence of I bl it's like three or four billion years ago mm -hmm. is when this had water right yeah ages ago right so what's crazy to me is that like again talking about like the human versus robot thing um this is now like our point of contact for the next two years yeah you know what i mean like like we can't... it's so annoying to send a human there to like look at some dirt for two years like we, we now just <laughs> yes we can have a, a a huge number of humans looking at that dirt with yeah. just kind of being their one person to investigate uh, i mean uh, and it's it's so weird. It's it's like it's like on one hand it's like a, a future science thing, but on the same thing it's kind of an Indiana Jones robot, right? Like it's there yeah, it's like anthropologically a... looking into the past on the on this. Well, little, maybe not anthropologically, but like yeah, yeah. Because anthro is like human, man. But yeah, I get what you're well, saying. Do 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 we do we know? Oh, if you're right. Humans there? Oh, yeah, we don't. I mean, yeah, I mean, what? how presumptuous for me to say, right? I mean, <laughs> that's not very scientific. That's Mark. not. I, w I my <laughs> mistake. Okay, here's a, a bigger picture. Um, this is a high res uh, a picture of this area. They had um, because I don't know why they don't take pictures of the entire planet in this this amount of detail. But well, I kind of do know why. Um, <laughs> I just don't want to talk about it because it's so complicated to go over why the entire planet isn't like a bunch of, of Google Earth. I've seen all the high-res high photos for the moon. And I'm talking about all of them, Sparks. And it's <laughs> it's not fun to go through. It is so arduous because it's from different. It has to be um, the same light lighting. It has to be from different angles, and all this stuff, so that way they can go into this area and make a 3D model of it, and you can like look up and down, pretend you're flying a space video game in it. It's crazy, and so okay, yeah, I get why they haven't done so, this. So, so, but so, in so, case, so by the way, I, I, let, I let Spike pointed out the the, yeah. the right word, xenopologically, right? Like the yeah. idea of like I don't I don't know, and then also like for those of you that don't know, um, a couple of uh, videos that we do on Ghost Giraffe um are are pretty low effort like we just have some fun the ones that look like we're just having fun are actually highly edited we, we, we spend a lot <laughs> yes. of time making them we spend a lot of and time then, on making ourselves look funny yeah we, we spend a lot of time making it like look like we're not spending a lot of time for the science videos there's actually a lot of work we go into to make those videos and specifically with regard to um the the moon videos of of the landing sites the crash sites yeah the crash sites the, the, there there was a lot of work that like was like okay we'll make a video about this oh wait this is well, yeah this in case you guys crazy. don't know what sparks is talking about we did a video and it's the first of its kind um to talk about where um you know what when the apollo missions landed on the moon you know they landed on the moon great then you got the um ascent modules that go back up and land with the take the um astronauts back off of the moon 
to the command module, well, guess what? Those ascent modules, what happened to them, right? They were sent back to the moon on purpose to crash. So I found the guy who found all of those crash sites because they weren't really cataloged that much by NASA. NASA no, 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 NASA didn't 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 care, and and didn't, you had yeah. to like go in and like do your own research yeah. that nobody was doing because it's not an official. And so yeah, NASA field didn't <laughs> NASA didn't have any photos of these crash sites till this guy found them himself, and it's just it's so funny. And then um. So we did a whole interview, we did a whole thing, and he sent me all this information. And if you go to it, you'll see all the photos and stuff. Sp Sparks did a wonderful voiceover for that uh, narration. and But the amount of photos you have to go through to look at a certain spot is just mind-numbing. I mean, just even just for myself, for looking at this kind of stuff. and But you, you get really addicted to looking at them, though. It's like one of those things where... I don't know. It's kind of like like when you start Minecraft and you think, okay, I'll just I'll just mine some diamonds. I'll be fun. And then next thing you know, you've created this entire civilization, and you have no <laughs> friends or family. And you haven't eaten. Uh, somehow, you know, you wake up and and then it's like you know, 15 years later. Um, and and it's much like that with these videos. But okay, here we go. We're in Jezero Crater. We're gonna zoom in on this high res area. This is where the the river came in. And it went over mm -hmm. here, and this is this area here, is uh, where they think they're going to find some nice, nice uh, organic stuff. Okay, so I, I might start asking questions that you don't know the answer to. Great. Um, this is where they have they have determined that this is a good site to go to for a lot of different reasons. But one of them that's kind of talked about is like, oh, water flowed from here to you know down that little uh, erosion uh, mark that they they have. Has there been any insight as to like where the water came from i um from the heavens from mount olympus i think you know it's from... <laughs> no no i mean like what was it oh the water i guess postulated it... they came from the ground like we have here oh no Earth, i think it was part of a whole like... sea i think if we zoom okay out, it only lets me out zoom out so much oh yeah it doesn't let me zoom out all the way uh, i think there's a whole other sea that was over here and then it went into here and went out a different way. Um, it might have just been like one of those those uh, if you think about the Great Lakes sort of um, scenario. Um, okay, so 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 it's 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 not postulated that like uh, rain groundwater is, yeah. came. It was more like rain existed in a in a place where this was just a, a sea. Well, I don't know if rain, but definitely ground water that was on the ground where back when Mars was warm enough to have liquid water because now it's with its one percent of earth's atmosphere a lot of people don't know that is mars only has one percent of earth's atmosphere it's so vacuous on mars that it's almost as though you're landing on a on a, a moon with no atmosphere on it even though it definitely has a significant atmosphere but with that there is no thermal um it, it, it's hard to keep things warm is what I'm trying to say. And so right. it can get into like the negative 200s over there. And when I was a kid, I thought Mars was, you know, all hot and stuff. But no, it's super, super duper cold. And that's because the sun um, was uh, shot off most of its atmosphere. And also its own dynamo didn't help it that much either. But I think it's not, it's not, this river wasn't a cause to, um, groundwater seeping in from from inside but the actual flowing systems now whether or not it rained back then um what the the tides were um if it yeah, had that, any tides that kind of stuff yeah, yeah. they they have theories they've written different theories on different things not to argue with each other like i'm, I'm right i'm right it's more like okay given these variables this is what mars would look like if this were the case and given these variables this is what mars would look like if this were the case so now when they're sending these missions they're trying to narrow down which of the different you know many science journal papers are most correct and trying to which figure by out the way is 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 crazy because honestly like in, in our lifetime mars 10 years ago the idea that there would be any evidence of anything organic on mars was like a a, a laugh in the face right? you know you just be like <laughs> a laugh yeah, in okay. the face 
a laugh in the face. <laughs> but like now, now, now it's like yeah. understood science where it's like, well, is there water on Mars? It's like, yes, yes, there, of course there was. Like, like no, no one doubts that now. It's 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 completely changed about you know, yeah, you know, what we know. You know what's even crazier, Sparks, is that this is where we will we allow ourselves to land. Okay, so uh, I have there's a okay. picture here somewhere of all the landing spots for our missions to Mars. But ladies and gentlemen, there are regions of Mars we will not send missions to on purpose. The same reason Oh, the are the, these are the sensitive sites. The sensitive sites, right? The same reason why we haven't sent anything to Venus because we're afraid we're going to screw things up. Oh, here we go. Um so aside from like, you know, little ones like Phoenix and and um and these other ones, you can see that most of the landing missions are on the equator. Now, actually, to tell you the truth, the main reason is that 1% atmosphere. It has more atmosphere around the equator to go through uh, to help slow slow down the mission so that way it can land. But also, uh, up over here, also another reason why is um, if you're on the equator, you're pointing at the sun most of the time. And so you got those solar arrays yeah, you want convenient. to be going. Right? Very convenient. But the other thing is there's some areas up by the poles that they're not sure that there could be life there, but there could be some kind of like, you know, bacterial or whatever little things that if if there is life, um, they don't want to screw it up. That's why they always talk about these missions as studying the um, past uh, evidence of past life. Um, they they word it very specifically of looking into the past rather than looking for the evidence of of things happening now. The only times they talk about um, things happening now is when they can just sniff an area like sniff the, the atmosphere of, of Venus using um, spectrometers or sniff the um, the the uh, organic salts of Enceladus using Cassini's um, little mm -hmm. little mm -hmm. probe probe nose All right and um, here it's it's interesting once again they're looking for past life but there's also those areas where we're thinking, hey, you know what? There might be something there, but we're not going to talk about it. And that's the part where I find kind of weird, where they just like, we're not going to talk about what we don't look at. We're just going to talk about what we do look like, look at, which I suppose mm -hmm. is a way to like keep things on on topic. But I don't know. Well, you know, I I feel like it's unfortunate to criticize uh, the failures of academia, honestly. So, one of the things that people need to know is that. You know what's going on right now with this mission yeah. is it, it feels like, oh NASA did it, <laughs> right? <laughs> yes, but like that's not what happened. Like there's a huge conglomerate of different corporations, oh yeah, different groups that have invested in discovery, and NASA is just kind of the administrator, uh, actually from like kind of an old an older time that that is there for coordinating his administrative things. This is actually like a bunch of human beings from various different reasons coming together to make this Mars uh, uh, discovery. Uh, I don't know what to. What do you What do you say? It's not. You're, you're landing a thing there for future discovery. It's It's like a, a conduit to so to make this conduit be, between future Mars research like happen, and and people don't like that story right yeah like it, even though it's like the honest story it's 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 messy um and that's the same thing that happens uh we had a, an earlier comp, uh, conversation in the chat and I, I wanted to point it out about what happens with anthropology here on earth where um you know there, there's a lot of people who have a lot of money writing on their books about history and so if somebody comes and goes like hey this yeah. thing looks older than current recorded history what do you think about that? And everyone's like, ah, no, 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 don't, don't do that. And then some other yeah. person comes in and is like, oh, well, clearly ancient aliens. That's that's what happened, right? Like, yeah. it's like maybe maybe the truth is actually like much more awkward, which is like may maybe civilization existed and then it fell and yeah, and now we have this amount of information about it. And so, so there there is no like cool answer that you're going to hear about anthropological or what was the word xenopological studies. Um, did we come from Mars? Probably not. Did, did, did Mars affect our development as a, as a living uh, organism on Earth? It, probably. How? Definitely I, is who now. Who knows? 
Yeah, <laughs> yeah, like, like n nobody has good answers to these things, and I, I would, I would say that everybody who's listening, um, the best thing that you can be primed with to enjoy everything that happens that NASA and private companies are doing with regards to space exploration, is to keep on your you know, critical thinking cap and just be like, cool. Like what, what did you hear? And, and don't let people like us <laughs> or other, other groups, you know, boil it down to be like, well, this is, this is what it is. It's like, no, yeah. like listen to like what information you're getting and, and, and hear about these crazy stories. Like, dude, we just put a robot on Mars again. Like we're getting pretty <laughs> good at it. That's pretty, yeah. that's pretty crazy. Yeah. Like, like that's amazing. Um, and and people who are telling us like oh no there's no life on Mars like those guys are crackpots now right like Mars is literally inhabited by robots. <laughs> <laughs> how, hey, how soon before you think uh, NASA wants to fund or or whoever is going up there that you know the conglomeration uh, wants wants to fund some of their scientific research by giving people rotations of driving their their rover. In uh, Oculus, oh yeah, right. Well, I imagine like uh, like somebody like I don't know. I could see that be a, a fun project Elon Musk would want to do. Be like, hey guys, um, uh, if you <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it, you kind of you, you're joking, but actually that is how science works. So with uh, Hubble um, and mm -hmm. a lot of these other telescopes, universities and uh, other professional astronomers or physicists or what have you, they write up uh, uh, proposals to be like, hey, um, point uh, Hubble at this galaxy for this many days. And they're like, okay, okay, right. we'll put you in the schedule and stuff like that. So it's 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 not unheard of. It's not unlike how things are actually run. And so imagine that. Imagine in the future, <laughs> you know, how like with uh, SpaceX – as it is now with all the uh, the Starlink satellites going all over the place, uh, raining havoc on astronomers right now. But imagine like a Starlink sort of, of network on Mars with uh, these little rovers and it, and it is driving around like, hey, guess what? $10,000 will get you a free ride around Mars. Get your kicks today. I mean, yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean there have been people who have already like made money on the Internet being like, do you want to drive my cat cam around my room with cats? Like, like there's, there's people who already do that. Yeah. Um, and what's crazy about it is like that, that is how, that is how progress runs is it's not about money. It's not about some like understanding fact of how the world works. Oh, it's, oh, it's, about, it's not about understanding facts. I think, I think you you hit it right on the spot there. <laughs> well, no, but it's it's not because um, you know capital T truth does exist, but it's mm -hmm. the pursuit of it with our attention that is the most important. And the more that we spend time caring about what happens on Mars, the more that that we will see these these crazy things that we're we're doing with with Mars. If, if which nobody goes back to, cared, which goes back to what we're, I brought up at the beginning of 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 this. Um, podcast like section of of the Mars Perseverance <laughs> uh, landing spectacular 2021, which is why are we doing this? Are we doing this for the science? Um, are we doing this for um, just being able to look around and see what's you know up in the attic? And is it more? What's more valuable? The kind of the experience of it all? Because right now we had the experience. We had the experience of watching a spacecraft, or I, can't, I guess interpreting a spacecraft landing on a different planet that we sent there with our own hands, with our own tax dollars and sent there. We got it to land. Everybody's super excited, right? Everyone, this is the part that everybody tunes in all 480 of you. Wonderful people are tuning in to this wonderful, awesome, historic thing that happened. And we will all forget about next week, but that's when the science comes <laughs> in. That's when all the cool pictures come in right after everybody tweets of what we spent $4 billion to get a black and white image of rocks. But, Later on in the month, we're going to get all like these panoramics. We're going to get these videos of the actual landing, of all, all these things happening. But the thing is, is that that wasn't the point of all this. The point of all of this is the study beneath those uh, those waves of light. Uh, get a spectrometer and split that beam of light and seeing what's out there um, in terms of composition and what happened in the past and what 
our what ourselves will be like when we get there with you know flying robots with changing the atmosphere from from whatever the heck it is to <laughs> to oxygen and right and so like what 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 part there what is what is the most important part um of all of this is is it the experience experiencing it or is it to do what we're trying to get people to be excited about to do i think I, I I think that uh, us tuning in is, is really valuable. Yeah. But I also think that, like, it's kind of like a weird uh, – I don't know how to how to put it. It's, it's almost like a, a, a soap opera. Like, we actually don't know. Like, you, you guys just tuned in for Chapter 1, and all we've seen so far is the opening credits. We don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> we saw the cold like, open. Honestly, yeah, yeah. And, like, this, this – could like, tomorrow we could be like – Oh yeah, the the robot died. Like we, we don't know, we don't know yet. Um, but also, like a week from now, we could be like, oh, it turns out that there's a, a bunch of Martian people and they live underneath the surface, and and this is this is how we talk to them. Like we don't know. That's one of the greatest things about exploring. Send uh, this photo. Very, is it picture blue or is it gold? <laughs> yeah, what what color is this dress? Um, <laughs> I feel yeah, like I, it, it's a lot like um, somebody said, uh, uh, what was it? 90% of humanity doesn't care about science, unfortunately. And that's a sentiment I kind of had growing up. Um, I was a huge nerd. I know you're a huge nerd too. But I remember uh, when I was in school, I would like do like show off these science experiments that I would just do by myself, right? I'd do them at, at school. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And everybody was like, what are you doing, nerd? Look at this guy. Oh, you're going you're gonna to talk – Klingon talk Klingon nerd. I'm like, guys, I'm more of a Star Wars guy. You know, if I'm gonna talk anything, it's gonna be Wookie. <laughs> but then I do whatever I'm doing. I can't. Remember, I think it was something I had to do with acid, and um, and not that kind of acid, but this other stuff. But they would all watch. <laughs> they would all stop making fun of me, and they would watch for like 90 seconds. And they would. You could tell that they wanted. They were in awe. They were like, oh, that's really cool. But as soon as it was over, entertain you know entertainment done right, they just walked away. They didn't say it was bad, good, or anything, but they walked away. And I wonder how many folks were we watched something like this, and it, sure it's really nice and cool and everything, but how many folks kind of like just walk away from it? And yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so here, here, here's the thought, Mars. Okay. So like, tell me thoughts. Okay. You, you, you and I, and all the people in chat. Uh-huh. are here we are experiencing we are this moment that like honestly a lot of people just went about their day and didn't even care that this historic thing was happening, yeah right? right oh well we already sent a robot to mars and you know it lasted way too long and, i have and a whatever. video game where i can go to mars right now can't, yeah, yeah yeah can't land on it it's terraformed but there you go but we're we're all here like knowing that this is going on and so what i what i wonder is like this mission is about like um focusing on proof scientifically about what really is the nature of quote life unquote on mars so what what are what is like the minimum and maximum output that could happen uh, re- realistically, not like yeah. oh, we we found some Martians and now we we have a reality show with some Martians. Like like realistically, like the minimum it seems is like we could actually find out that there is proof that there has never been life on Mars. That there was organic material and it never yeah. was interesting. Uh, maximum again, like we're, we're not going to be parting with Martians next week. It's not going to be like hey, yeah, we jumped into. Uh, a, a sp- we we jumped into that Tesla you had orbiting the Earth because like yeah let's party with like there clearly is not like like intelligent life actively communicating with Earth it's not like we're like visiting another town with human beings but what what is the maxima that you think will happen with this endeavor do you think it will be proof of some like uh, microbes that existed billions of years ago do you think we'll find maybe some actual life like do you think it's possible I think we'll find this is... organisms like what, what what do you think will be like a positive outcome other than the zero life theory i think the positive outcome is that this will go on as incrementally incrementally whatever and as slow as science has always progressed 
where this is a link in a much larger network of different chains linking all of our knowledge and ingenuity together. But there's not going to be like best outcome, I think. I mean, the best outcome is something that, not best outcome, I should say extraordinary outcome. The extraordinary outcome would be, you know, aliens opening a hatch and they're like, hey, where's, you know, where's the fourth season of Arrested Development? I, that that would be like the thing that would like change everything but the way this mission is is built um it's not for that it's for you know even if they find those signs of intelligent life um intelligent life sorry uh <laughs> they might not have found that anyway <laughs> uh if of any sort of life that's not going to stop exploration because then the next logical thing is like well i guess we're the first ones you know and then start implanting ourselves into the situation but i don't think there's going to be something where like a big breakthrough thing that's going to come out from this and it's not designed to do that um because i think it'd be built a a much larger um uh headline (laughs) on it but in any case well uh, I think I, I, what I do think it's 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 definitely going to keep us going, keep us interested. Because yet again, like you said, we landed on Mars again, but like it's still exciting. And I think when we get um, more images from this uh, mission and we start normalizing how extraordinary our ability to go to other planets are, then when we start thinking ourselves going to Mars. I think just ourselves seeing ourselves in the cosmos as like a society on earth. Um, Mm -hmm. It's not going to be like this. Oh, can we do it? Should we do it? It's like, we are doing it. And here's, you know, here's just another incremental thing, but it's like this, it is a kind of a a small leap, a giant leap sort of thing. Okay. So just to kind of like circle back completely Mars. um, Here's what I would like to know. Um, we're having a lot of people celebrating this moment. Yeah. It's exciting. I, I like exciting. I like experiencing these like moments of like uh-huh. holy we we just did something crazy. Um I would like uh at least in the next little bit for for chat to let us know like wh- what is the next what is the next moment that we should clue in on for for the ghost draft audience? Like what what is the next moment that we should be celebrating and paying attention to like it's it's pretty mm-hmm. obvious like yeah there's these things where like oh we, we sent this rocket we landed on mars blah 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 but for this story specifically like what are people interested in to like hear next in this story you know what i mean like yeah yeah because i know what i want to hear so it'd, it'd be really interesting what do you to hear, hear what you guys what, what... want to hear from it given like a lot have <laughs> i've thought of and a lot of you might have just found out about this just now and it come in with a perspective that I wouldn't have come up with. So I, I, I would love to hear from you guys. Well, what do you want to hear about next? Like what, what is yeah. the next thing that will, that will come from uh, this landing that you're like, Oh, okay. Yeah. Like, do you want to just hear about like next data? Do you want to hear, like, what do you want to hear? I think my chat is froze. I don't know why. I see. I cared. T loved cared. That's the last <laughs> thing I saw. I saw Fulio Beardy say something that that I really r- agree with. I do want to hear about the James Webb launch. Yes. Oh my God. We'll be yeah. there for that. One hundred percent will be there. We were there physically for it. Um, uh, we. I was the last one of the last people to see it at um, Goddard. It left the day afterwards, and I got to see it with my own <laughs> eyes. It was crazy. And we got to interview the planetary scientist who um, helped plan a lot of the um, the science that's going into um, analyzing other things. And then Sparks, you saw it at Johnson. Yeah, yeah. We we asked them some questions that that <laughs> made them a little awkward. They're like, "Who are who are you?" Because <laughs> we we asked them the the first question we asked them out of the gate was, "Tell us the the." the worst thing that's happened did you ever lose a screw or something and they, they were like did. yeah which they did and they were like you're not from the traditional media and they were like no I, we don't know why we're we have a ghost draft here. we're from the internet <laughs> video games and they had, and they immediately invited us into the control room because they they thought that, that was like okay that was that was fun um by the way the chat seems to say um they're pretty interested in like how the the chopper goes i think yeah. that's that's fair i actually want to know how that goes too because like 
What? <laughs> that could end in tears or be really cool. Like it could be just so sad and that would be also hilariously awesome to watch yeah. or it could be amazing. Yeah. Okay. You know what? I'm going to uh, end this stream with how it began. I want you guys to feel the power of the, the suspense of the beginning of the stream and just mm -hmm. rest in knowing that after watching this video that we did it. We landed on Mars. We did a fantastic job. And I'm saying we as if I'm part of the team that won the Super Bowl. <laughs> I'm yeah. part of the team that, you know. Chat, we, chat, we did it. We, we landed we did on it. Mars. You know, we clapped <laughs> really hard and that we sure we sure made those thrusters work. But <laughs> this this video, uh, it gets me every time. Like, I get chills. And and just know that at the end of it, oh, we did it. All right. I'm going to let the audio play here. And we'll see you guys on Thursday. Not Thursday. We are on Thursday. We'll see you guys on Thursday. Saturday for our usual live stream and thanks so much for coming in but here here we go watch this can be taken for granted when you get to Mars there's a lot of things we just don't know space always has a way of throwing us curveballs and surprising us I mean until we get the data that says we're on the ground safely I'm going to be worried that we're not going to make it entry descent and landing is often referred to as the seven minutes of terror because it takes about seven minutes to get from the top of the atmosphere of Mars to the ground safely. The spacecraft has to do all of this by itself. There are many things that have to go right to get Perseverance onto the ground safely. There's a lot counting on this. This is the first leg of our sample return relay race. There's a lot of work on the line. Starting about 10 minutes before atmospheric entry, we get rid of really the spacecraft part of, of the rover that's been supporting us. We come screaming in to the Martian atmosphere at 12 to 13,000 miles per hour. And the heat shield is what dissipates all that initial energy through friction. The vehicle will continue actually flying itself through the atmosphere. It's sort of like a transforming vehicle that went from spacecraft and now it's kind of like an aircraft actively guiding itself. When we're going slow enough, we deploy a parachute. The biggest supersonic parachute we've ever sent to another planet. It's critical for slowing down the vehicle. Perseverance's entry, descent, and landing borrows heavily from that of Curiosity. But fundamentally, Perseverance is a different rover. She's bigger, she has different instruments. We've added a lot of smarts on the inside to make it more capable so that it can deal with the landing site that we've given. The science team identified Jezero Crater as basically an ancient lake bed and one of the most promising places to look for evidence of ancient microbial life and to collect samples for future return to Earth. Uh, the problem is it's a much more hazardous place to land. You look at Jezero, all you see is danger. How do we go to a site that we never thought was safe enough to go to before? So the heat shield, which has protected us all the way through entry, is no longer necessary. We need to get that off so that we can actually see the ground. And we can see the ground in a couple different ways. Perseverance will be the first mission to use terrain relative navigation. So while it's descending on the parachute, it will actually be taking images of the surface of Mars and determining where to go based on what it sees. This is finally like landing with your eyes open. Having this new technology really allows Perseverance to land in much more challenging terrain than Curiosity or any previous Mars mission could. Amongst the rocks and the craters and the cliffs, these things are hazardous to the rover, but these are the things that are interesting to the scientists. Once Perseverance has figured out where she is, we jettison the back shell and parachute and light up our rockets. Those rockets help us steer to a safe landing spot that's nearby. That descent stage takes us all the way down to about 20 meters off the ground. That's when we start the sky crane maneuver. And once the rover has hit the ground, the descent stage will cut loose from the rover and fly away to a safe distance. Surviving that seven minutes is really just the beginning for Perseverance. Its job, right, being the first leg of sample return to go look for those signs of past life on Mars. All that can't start until we get Perseverance safely to the ground. And then that's when the real mission begins. <coughs> and that was it. And at 3.55 Eastern Standard Time, Perseverance landed on Mars. You can watch it again in the... Uh, in the archives when we, once we have this published and thank you guys thank you sparks for coming i hope you guys have a great week sparks 
I just love everybody. Yay, space. <laughs> Yay, space. All right. See you guys later.